left. Copying it makes one thing more. That's what copying's for. Copying is not there. Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to the Voluntary Life. This episode is about intellectual property, and it's a discussion following on from the previous episode, the interview with Stefan Kinsella about his book Against Intellectual Property. After the interview with Stefan, um, a group of us stayed on the line to discuss some of the ideas that were raised by Stefan Kinsella and also some of the uh, thoughts that Steph Molyneux had on the call. So in this episode, you'll hear us talk about those ideas um, around um, intellectual property and whether it's valid uh, or not, and the issues relating to um, intellectual property today and technology and so forth. We do make reference directly back to the uh, interview with Stefan Kinsella, so if you haven't heard that episode yet, uh, you might want to listen to that first uh, before you hear this one. So I hope you enjoy the discussion, and thanks so much for listening. Well, thanks so much for coming along. Did you enjoy it? The only thing that I would say was um, it is a little frustrating about this subject as a whole is that we're in a situation right now I mean, where we can't even really talk about like legitimate definitions or defenses for property. Um, I mean, it's like a complete state of nature as far as um, property, whether it's intellectual or physical. You know, with the presence of the state and its involvement in property and intellectual property, um, everything is kind of like there's already a huge initiation of aggression going on. And so everything else after that is basically just people sort of jostling for position within that framework, if that makes any sense. I think and, I, I think I know what you mean in the sense that I, I mean, tell me if I'm misinterpreting, but is, is what you're saying that. You know, this is all a bit abstract, talking about sort of like the fine points of intellectual property when in general property is so poorly understood or enforced. Is that what you mean? Not just poorly understood and enforced, but actually distorted and corrupted and um, um, intentionally <laughs> uh, mystified, right, um, for the sole purpose of um, giving the state a purpose, right? Yes. Right. But, and, no. so, and so, and so, arguing arguing over whether um, you know um, uh, the Beatles have a right to their songs is sort of like arguing over um, um, you know who who owns the fire plug, right? I don't know quite what that means. What's what's a what's a fire plug? Um, the, the fire hydrant. The little, yeah, a little red fire hydrant on the corner where the f fire department comes and connects up to it. That that thing. Uh, oh, you mean like there's a fire burning the house down, and let's not argue about um, who owns the fire hydrant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I sort of, I, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I mean, frankly, the the two arguments that the, the argument that you made um, about Apple and the argument that Charlotte made about Monsanto. I mean. I think they're really clear and current issues. And, you know, I think there's a very clear right and wrong in that say, in that case. And you could just say, oh, well, you know, everything's so messed up anyway, who knows? But actually, no, I mean, I think those two cases of clear um, uh, and egregious violations of, of, um, uh, of um, sort of innocent third parties, so to speak. Hmm. So, I mean, I, I sort of know what you mean, but where does that lead you? Do you just kind of say, oh, fuck it? We'll, well because, you know, what can we be, be, because Steph's actual response to that was uh, um, was pretty accurate. I mean, uh, the GUI interface, if we want to go back to unique inventions, I mean, that belongs to Xerox, right? So In Xerox Park, yeah. Yeah, but that's why, um, I mean, that's why this whole intellectual property thing, I think, is just completely unsustainable. You can't, you, you cannot establish any decent arguments to define ownership of ideas in other people's heads. You just can't do that. In, in a free society, um, what would happen there? I mean, it, it's hard what to... Would it's, happen there? 
it, it's hard to speculate, but um, like Xerox invents um, the GUI interface, right? And uh, Apple and a handful of other computer manufacturers see it and like it. And like, what would happen in that situation? Like, if they hadn't like used um, state mechanisms to um, to um, file for co- file for patent or copyright or whatever, and um, it were just open to negotiation. Like what would ha- what would Atari and Apple and Commodore have have done, right? Like, would they have done the same thing? Would they have done something different? Would they have done something not a, nothing at all? I mean, I mean, what sort of negotiation would have come out of that with with Xerox, right? Would there have been some sort of um, partnership agreement? Um, you know, who knows, right? Like, there's there's no way to speculate. Like what would have happened had the state not been there imposing sort of um, Xerox uh, patents in the first place and, and then people going sort of like under the radar to violate that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, there is no way of knowing, but I imagine that in a really free society, everybody would live with the understanding that if you communicate ideas – then ideas will be used and they will be reproduced. And that therefore, A, you just got to live with it because that's the way that, like, it's like if I invent a new term in this conversation, it's going to be, I can't then sort of suddenly expect that nobody else will ever use that word. It's just in, it's just a free flow of ideas. And I, I think then you would simply have to be creative about saying, well, um, you know, I will release all of my music on the internet and then I'll charge people to come and watch me play because yeah, nobody can that, copy that experience. That, that's, a really, that's a really strong argument um, in, in my view uh, because, like I was asking before, where does the actual initiation of force occur, right? The initial instance of aggression, um, it, 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 in the case of the Apple HTC thing, like – Assuming the state wasn't there, right? Um, it, it had to have been Apple, right? I can't invent something on my lawn and then tell you if you copy me, I'm going to shoot you in the head, right? Like I can't. It's completely, it's completely out of order for Apple to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And everybody gets it emotionally. I mean, everybody kind of feels like that it's kind of sleazy what, what Apple are doing. But, um, you know, and, and for a reason, because, I mean, clearly they just, they're just trying to bully people not to compete with them. Yeah, yeah. That's, and it, we, we, we could see what good that, that did um, uh, Sun and uh, Netscape against uh, Microsoft, right? <laughs> a lot oh, of good that did. Yeah. Last from the past. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing, if you guys, um, since um, since we're all still on, you know, um, that question that I was asking in the beginning, like, which way do you think it's going to go? Do you think it's going to go the way that basically, the, given a generation, people are just going to say, you know what, I mean, forget it. This intellectual property is just completely unenforceable. And that the law will, will be one of those, like, weird statutes that just sits around um, because – because it's just unenforceable, or do you think it's going to go, you know, more and more in the other way of state power that, that it'll just be used as an excuse to basically come and, you know, uh, randomly monitor people's downloads or whatever, you know? Government, yeah. yeah I mean, that's, think- that's, that's being done in the UK now, isn't it? I mean... Yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah, so they're going for the government lockdown route. I think there was, there was legislation in the UK which they tried to pass for to allow police officers to actually hack people's machines or monitor their emails and things. But that luckily got blocked. But the thing is, I mean, it's like every other month they were um, trying to re- release a new piece of legislation to control the internet. And at the moment, the, the big thing, the big killer for the internet the moment is the, um, the, that, the secret bill of whatever internet policing or whatever. I can't remember what it's called. 
But one of the things in there... Digital um, Rights. Yeah, the Digital Rights Act um, is going to make um, distributors of information um, that will be liable for any copyright infringement that occurs. So people, like, well, like YouTube, you know, they will be um, liable if anyone uploads um, copyrighted material on there. Mm. Which it, um, YouTube themselves will be liable if people upload yeah, copyright which is material. A, a very serious thing. Because another thing is like net cafes that like, just have free Wi-Fi and stuff that will become illegal. I mean, they, they're really going to kill the internet in a big way by doing that. Because um, all uh, net cafes and things they would have to um, either file for being an ISP or they have to stop using uh, free Wi-Fi. Yeah. I mean, that's this for, for the internet. This is the next place where it's going to go. Is where we're going to have you know like. Uh, um, entire, you know, like nationwide wireless network, so we can have internet anywhere. But that's going to be prevented from happening because of government legislation. So we're going to miss out on some really cool internet stuff. <laughs> but instead, I mean, what instead, what we're going to end up with is just one big gigantic public park that's completely unmaintained. Going to end up with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, really. <laughs> We 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 already pretty much have that. I mean, uh, right? I mean, if 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 if, if I'm spe if I'm misspeaking, you know, you know, please correct me. But no, that's you're quite right about that. We pretty much already have that because you know, that we have we have technology that could. The technology is out there that could solve a lot of these problems, and they tried to push the DRM stuff, and obviously that didn't work very well. But you know. It, it's not. It's not even a technology because the technology is just a tool. It's. It, it's about. Well, I guess it's. I guess it's more about you know people's understanding of morality, right? Yeah. And it, you're not going to get. Um, it's just complete amateur nonsense, right, as Steph would say. But I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of traction in something as abstract as intellectual property. Before you actually get something, you know, like murder is wrong no matter who pulls the trigger. You know, I just – I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's – intellectual property is going to kind of be what follows after you get moral clarity and things that are actually physical and concrete. Uh, the, what would people think about that? <laughs> No, I think you're 100 percent right, James, and that's that's one of the reasons why I was asking the questions I was asking. Is you know where is the force actually taking place? Like where is the initiation of force actually happening in an IP exchange? Um, who is actually aggressing against whom? And that's that's really the bottom line because once you understand that, then that's pretty simple, right? There's, mm. you don't need like huge volumes of uh, of law books to explain to you how to respond to somebody sticking a knife in you, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, you don't need any anything at all for that. You just go ow and claps. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to ask because um, yeah, on on this subject, like, do we have any? Are we all just like in agreement? Does anybody actually still have some reservations about saying that intellectual property is just completely a load of nonsense? Or because I, I know that no, I think okay, okay. intellectual property is okay as long as you can enforce it without violence. I mean, um, like on a contractual basis of having businesses which you know allow for uh, research and development, you know, to, so they can get back the costs effectively. I think I mean it's a good system. But it, only as long as you can enforce it in right. a decent way. But in, that's the sort of, if it's by contract idea, which then it wouldn't be intellectual property law, it would just be contract law. Yeah. And that, I, I would totally agree. I mean, there's nothing wrong with contract law, but I think the point that, that Kinsella was making is that if you, if you did that, you just remove, like, basically all of IP because the, the only real basis for IP is the people who haven't signed the contract going yeah. after them. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's all about that's all about controlling what other people do with their property. Exactly. 
exactly. And, and yeah. that's what that's what really bothers me about this, and and and, and also why I just I, I don't understand why Steph is hanging on to that argument, the the imputed income argument, because that's a slippery slope, right? Like down the road, I could say you're aggressing against me, Jake, if you don't say. Uh, Let's say I ask you for a business loan, right? And you don't give it to me and my business fails. Like, I could claim that you aggressed against me and caused my business to fail, right? Yeah, or you could say, for example, that uh, we both decide to go for the same job and you get the job and I don't. Well, I mean, now you have aggressed against me because I've lost my future income because I would have got the job if you hadn't. If you hadn't taken that job, then I would have got the job. But, of course, I have no rights or ownership over something that I don't own. That you don't own. And, it's that uh, simple. It's well, that simple. It, it's I, interesting because... I don't, understand, I oh, don't understand why... I was just going to say, I, I also really can't see that that argument has any legs. I don't know why Steph's holding onto it either. Well, like something that I... Like I'm... Especially because, Jake, you first mentioned the uh, the intellectual property stuff to me What back in... December, right? Or maybe even November. Like before, it was before Christmas. You mentioned it to me. And that was because I was still like kind of by default on the pro side of things. Right. And now I've, I'm, I'm on the, uh, the anti IP just as a moral argument side of things. But that having been said, I haven't figured out how to, the, how to square that with my gut discomfort of like, well, it's interesting because every now and then I'll like download a song, right? Or I'll I'll even download something that I can't find with torrents. But like I haven't figured out how to kind of square my gut discomfort with my intellectual knowledge that IP is 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 not not valid as a moral theory. So I'm curious if anyone else has that kind of ambivalence still. That's an interesting point. So what you're saying is that like you know intellectually it all makes perfect sense but therefore why is it that you feel uncomfortable downloading a song right or like i'm i i, I feel a gut level discomfort or, or like I, I i intellectually know that it's not an, an evil thing to download software but that doesn't mean i'm going to go on a torrent site and find photoshop right 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 as nice as it would be to have photoshop for free and in the, at the same time, I would understand that I'm not being evil, but still I, I have a gut level discomfort with that. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's just kind of a, I also have a gut level discomfort with. Well, that's why, that's why I asked the question I asked, which is, is that an, ish, an initiation of force on your part, Greg, to go and, and download a cracked copy of, of uh, Photoshop? Is that an initiation of force? Now, I'm not saying, are you committing murder? It's it's just, a, I mean, a minor, minor initiation. But still, is it an initiation? Right? I don't, well, I don't, I, I don't think that it would be. I don't, I don't think it would be either. Why not? I think it's, because, uh, that situation is I mean, more of a, a logical thing rather than a moral thing. Because we kind of understand the fact that if we don't provide money for whatever thing that's being created, then that thing wouldn't exist. And we currently live in a copyright-based society, so what people aren't kind of used to the fact that they have to kind of pay for stuff. When I'm trying to explain that properly, I mean, people would like download music and everything. And um, if we didn't have copyright, we'd have some other system to compensate people for doing things. And we don't currently have that system. And we're kind of like logically aware that we need to compensate people for the things. That no, I, I think way. I think Carlos is. I, I I really get that because I think, for example, Greg, in your case, in I mean, this is all completely hypothetical, but let's just say that emotionally, you know, you know that you should give Photoshop, I don't know, fifty cents or or whatever it is, right? You should give them something, but it's not. <laughs> Photoshop is a little more than fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is, I'm talking about a, oh, a no IP world, right? Got it. Okay. Sorry. Right. I'm talking about an no IP world. So you should give them some kind of monthly subscription fee of some, I don't know, whatever it is, right? And it would probably be pretty cheap because these things would be so pervasive and so easy to, that, like, basically, the economy would be so much more efficient anyway. Right. But you oh, can't just be, choose, 
there would be more competitors to Photoshop that, as well, right? That's an right, excellent. Right. That's an excellent point, Jake, and it actually goes back to what I was saying before about the, the, the environment being so corrupt and so distorted that, you know, um, <laughs> that, that you can't really – you can't label Greg downloading Photoshop as an initiation of force. But in, in a free society where the initiation of force didn't already exist um, – it would be so easy to get Photoshop that it wouldn't be an issue. Right. And the problem is that in this, as Carl was saying, in this situation, you can't effectively, you can't just pay 50 cents a month or whatever it's going to be. Cause you know, what are you going to do? Just like write them a check or something <laughs> from some random guy. I mean, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I owe you this much, you know? So, um, <laughs> You either got the choice to pay what is, you know, a kind of monopoly price enforced by IP, or to pay nothing. Yeah, and emotions aren't binary, right? So your emotions give you an idea of how things might be market if it was in a free society with rational people. So it's actually a quite healthy, proportionate response to having to live in a brutal and um, system which kind of splits you, you know, between two extremes. Yeah. Well, I guess you could also do what Steph does and rent movie or download movies and if you like them go to the store and rent them and drop them back in the box yeah, yeah i'm sure i'm not sure how that would work with your photoshop example though <laughs> <laughs> right that's a good point <laughs> i know when I, when I um downloaded stuff before i mean like i remember like years ago i downloaded half-life the game and actually went out and bought it after downloading the game so i was like wow this is really amazing and then i went out and bought the game and and i've done that with a lot of things like games if i've downloaded them and then uh, Crap, and I just sort of delete them, and then that's mm-hmm. the end of that. But games that I, you know, I like, I mean, I go out and buy them, you know, because that, that's how I show my appreciation for something which is really, really good. But then, funnily enough, I, I don't do that with music. <laughs> I, right. mean, I mean, I, I know I, there's some like particular musicians which I will, you know, like find the time to compensate them somehow. But um, like with music, I have quite a big music collection, and I haven't, I mean, to this day, I've never bought any music ever. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I first started getting music when I got a PC and I figured out I could download stuff. Um, and I think it's kind of weird because I, what I found that um, on the internet, there is enough um, legally free music for me to listen to music for the rest of my life and never actually have to buy any. So I think that's kind of uh, a thing in there as well of why I wouldn't pay for music. Uh, is the fact that there is that, that much freely available music anyway. Are you talking about Todd uh, safe stuff? Or? Yeah. Well, people, stuff that people give away for free. Right. I mean, there's enough of it out there. Because, I mean, like, oh, the internet's, I mean, but lots and lots of people on the internet. If everyone yeah, writes an article mm-hmm. that's one minute long, you'd never be able to read them all in your life. Right. So some content is kind of unlimited. Um, more and more major bands are doing that now as well. Like, it's not just limited to really obscure people that no one's ever heard of. Um, I mean, and actually, you know, some bands like... Um, Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails are actually making a fortune doing it that way. Like, yeah, I mean, like, Radiohead... Radio, radio, uh, like radio had made more money with in rainbows, the one that they did for free with donations, than they did out of all their other albums combined. Like their yeah. profit that they took home. I think Trent, Trent Reznor made a fortune out of his last out of his last year albums as well because he released it for free. But then for the people who he were really like real hardcore fans, he released you know like four hundred dollar box sets with special art and stuff like that, and that's where he made. And he made more profit from that doing it through than doing it through a record label. Right. Maybe you could buy a Photoshop t shirt, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there, there's a definite trend away from like a monolithic you know, central source system to a distributed source system, and that's really like uh, and maybe that's just sort of something that's going to continue to happen as far because it's you know it happens in music and people become that much more successful when they don't have to go through the radio co- or uh, record company, right? Um, and well, you, I mean, you have people like there's the example, the examples, the music examples that Hannah was just saying, where people are clearly making money out of releasing music for free, and you have people making money out of free operating systems too. I mean, there are lots of people making money out of Linux. It's just that they're providing other services and not not actually 
you know, the source code itself is, is the way that they actually make the money. All right. Other services or custom, uh, custom enhancements for yeah, regular right. applications? Yeah. Well, and then with like things like Firefox, I mean, one of the ways that they kind of get the labor force that a lot of companies would pay for is by providing the value, which is that if, if, if a developer works on the source code for, my, for uh, Firefox, I mean, that's a lot of experience. It's, it's, it builds a little bit of, I guess, of a peer prestige, and then they can like use that as experience on their resume. So they get that same labor without kind of having to charge for the product and then pay the developers in a sense. And the amazing thing is that, you know, these whole, all these IP arguments about, well, you know, we would never be able to develop this, that, and the other if it wasn't for having an IP. And then you think, well, in the mid-90s, I'm sure that Encyclopedia Britannica would have said, oh, well, nobody would ever have an encyclopedia if it wasn't for us to be able to protect our encyclopedia through through IP. And actually, you know, the best encyclopedia in the world is free. And, well, and, and furthermore, if, if you would have... If you would have asked uh, – actually, this was an example. That very example was used in this book that I'm reading, Drive, by Daniel Pink, that if you – if like 10 years ago, if you would have con- gone to economists and, and told them – and asked them, okay, which of these encyclopedias will be the most popular encyclopedia in 10 years? Either one that's made by Microsoft that hires the best editors in the world, the best writers in the world, and they spend billions of dollars – not billions, millions of dollars on making this wonderful – they, they update it every year, or one that doesn't pay its writers, doesn't pay its editors, but they ha- it runs on volunteers. Um, anyone can edit it and stuff like that, which would be the most popular. No one would guess that Encarta wouldn't even exist anymore, and Wikipedia would be by far the most popular. No one would have ever guessed it. I think right. Wikipedia has a paid staff of 30 now. I, you're right. They, they do. But they, uh, are, they are funded voluntarily through... Uh, through donations. Quite right. Quite right. So are they editorial staff or are they tech staff? I think they're support staff and they're like technical staff. Right. So, I mean, essentially it's still the same principle then in that the general public are the ones doing the writing and editing. Right. Yeah, I think it's just administrative costs that they do for paid staff. Yeah. Presumably they have a few servers to... <laughs> to, to <laughs> <laughs> Just one or two. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Otherwise, maybe it's time I to... I think I'm done. Well, it was great fun talking to you guys. All right, guys. Well, have a great evening. Have a good night, Jake. Later. Bye, everyone. <laughs>